Let's pray as we begin this evening. Father God, thank you that we can come here together and we can um, listen and we can see the pictures and get a, a, a sense of what is going on in a different part of the country. And Lord, I pray uh, for each one of us that you would speak to us tonight. Uh, that this wouldn't just be an evening of hearing of something that is happening somewhere else, uh, but that uh, there would be something tonight that would speak to each one of us, uh, that by your grace we would leave different, different in some way, having learned something, having taken something from tonight that would uh, impact upon us, uh, and our lives as we go from here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We've prepared a slideshow uh, for you to show you some of the places that we're working and some of the things that we're doing. Um, but we would like, first of all, to open the Bible together uh, and uh, to let Scripture speak to us. Uh, partly because it's, that's always a good idea. Um, you see, you can't argue with me when I say that. Um, <laughs> but also because that is what we are trying to do with people. That is what we are seeking to do. We're seeking, when we meet with people, to open the Bible with them uh, and to look at Scripture and to let Scripture speak to us. So by starting in that way, we, we demonstrate something of what we're doing uh, at Salt House. So we'll, we'll do that first. And I'd like you... Have you got Bibles with you, anyone? It's all on the screen. It's all on the, it's all on the screen, so you're all right. Right. Um, so I'd like to read, first of all, from, from Matthew. Um, we'll read this. Have we got two different versions on the PowerPoint? There, you see, I, I can remember, really. Um, and we'll do what's sometimes called Lectio Divina, if anyone's come across that. Um, we... We read the passage um, slowly yes. and we ask God uh, to bring to our attention something in this passage uh, and just be open to the particular word or particular phrase uh, that might just strike you from this. And then we'll take a few moments to share with one another uh, what has particularly come out from this particular passage to you tonight and we can share that and share together. Uh, so we'll read this slowly and uh, just see what God's, God draws your attention to. And we've got the passage twice, so we'll read it twice together. I'll do the first one, you do the second one, eh? and then you get second okay. voices. Right. So first of all, reading from the New Revised Standard Version. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavours of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste Godliness. You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the rubbish. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colours in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. So 
So just have a moment or two of quiet and uh, reflect on those words. Think about if there's a particular phrase or a particular word which God draws to your attention. And then in a moment I'll ask you to share that with your neighbour. Just turn to one or two people near, near you, around you. And we'll share what God has brought to our attention. Okay, so um, the, the project that we're part of is called Salt House. And uh, brief introduction, uh, about a year and a half ago, um, Barbara and I got to a change in our lives, as, as you may be aware. I, I work for the Baptist Association here in the Northeast, and uh, my role was made redundant. Um, Barbara was training for ministry, and she was into her final year of training. And so together, it, the, the, those two um, uh, experiences kind of dovetailed for us to... Uh, come and seek God and say, okay, what next? What do you have next for us? And uh, as we prayed and as we thought, uh, in particular, we got the conviction that we were being called to what's called pioneering, which is uh, uh, getting out beyond where the church currently reaches and trying to engage with people who would not be part of the existing church. Uh, or another way of looking at it is to see what God is doing out in the world and join in. Uh, often we in mission like to say, right, God, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. Please bless our mission. Uh, whereas the pioneering approach says, well, God's already doing mission in our world, in our community. Uh, and our call, our vocation is to get involved with what God is doing. And the other conviction that I had in particular was that as I get older, uh, I don't want to be somebody who becomes more comfortable uh, and uh, more conservative um, and I'm not talking politics particularly. Um, there are other political parties to vote for at the upcoming election. Um, but uh, to, to keep that radical heart, which certainly is, as, as the Baptist tradition is, is part of our DNA. Uh, and I believe actually if we are growing in our faith as we grow older, we should become more radical, more close to the roots of our faith, more close to uh, the mission of God, more filled with love and compassion for others. Uh, and so, yes... Physically, we might not always be able to do the things we used to do when we were younger. I know all about that, um, especially tr trying to uh, train to do a, a long-distance run this year and finding it a lot harder than when I was younger. Um, but nevertheless, uh, to, to be willing to take risks and make sacrifices and, and, and to go uh, on, on new adventures of faith. So that's what we're doing. So uh, God has called us uh, to the west of England to... Uh, live in a little village called Pill and to work in a town called Portishead. Barbara's going to tell you all about them and show you some lovely pictures in a moment. But before we do, we're going to watch a video because some of you might also know that um, I, I did something a bit crazy uh, in the summer. We moved house from Prado, where we lived, in the northeast, down to Pill. Uh, we unpacked or started unpacking and then after three days, with Barbara's permission... Uh, she was very gracious. I, I took a train all the way back to Prudder and decided to do the journey all over again, but this time on foot. So I walked 530 miles from Prudder to, uh, to Pill, uh, which was for me a, uh, an important part of my preparation uh, of, of giving God some time. And the most significant thing that happened to me is what this video is going to depict. I got to Gloucester and uh, I... I lingered a bit in the, in the city. It was a beautiful day like we've had today. Um, and uh, then I got out onto the footpath beside the River Severn. And uh, in Gloucester, the River Severn divides into two channels and then they come together at a place called Lower Parting. And I got to Lower Parting and read a sign that explained the history. Uh, and then it explained about the Severn Boar. And uh, the Severn Boar is a tidal wave that, particularly in the spring and the autumn, comes up the river. Uh, it's, it's all to do with the uh, the way the, the that time of year the tides are, 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 are bigger uh, and more pronounced and the River Severn estuary has the second highest tidal rise and fall in the whole world apparently. Uh, and I was looking at, at all this and thinking it would be really great sometime if I could see the Severn Boar. And as soon as I've had the thought, this is what happened. <laughs> So it's not just one wave, as you can see, it's lots of waves. It, the river gets turned up, the, the water level is a lot higher, there's, there's currents and there's all kinds going on for about an hour afterwards. It's quite, 
And it's quite dramatic in its own way. It's not, it's not a huge thing, but it's big enough for a couple of guys to surf on it. Um, and I happen to be, by chance, uh, at the right place at the right time to see this. Uh, it, it doesn't happen um, that often, uh, certainly not like that. And I was really quite taken by it. And I felt that, for me, God was saying that the ministry he was calling me and Barbara to was about being open and being ready and that God is going to bring in a wave of his, his life, his blessing, his kingdom. Um, all he's calling me uh, and, and all of us maybe to do is to be open and to be ready. God does the work. We are simply the ones that he calls to be there and able to join in when the time comes. Uh, that doesn't mean we're idle the rest of the time. But uh, there's something about being ready and being open and available to whatever God might do. And trusting that God can do great things. Even if we haven't seen much uh, over the last weeks, months, years, uh, God is more than able to do amazing things. Ian and I, in, in, in our chat earlier, were just touching on the fact that there is a, an increasing openness again in our society, in our, in our uh, country, particularly amongst what's called Gen Z, the, the youngest people, 10 to 25-year-olds. Uh, there are lots of people coming to faith in that generation at the moment. Even in this city, uh, of, of these town and city of Gateshead in Newcastle. It's happening here. So uh, let's be open uh, and see what God wants to do. Anyway, that's a little thought for you. I'm going to hand back to Barbara, who's going to introduce you to Portishead and Pill. So if God is calling us to be in the right place at the right time, which seemed to be the word for us, what, what is the right place? Well, I don't know how well you can see this map, but it's a, a map of the, uh, the, the southwest, and there is the Bristol Channel, that's the blue bit, uh, and with the, the circles around are there Porter's Head and then Pill. And uh, Porter's Head is by the coast, uh, very near the, uh, the docks, uh, the River Avon, comes uh, in at that point into the, the Bristol Channel uh, and, uh, and then the river goes up to, to the centre of, of Bristol City. And uh, this is a shot of our house. This is where we're living in Pill, a lovely wisteria that was very overgrown when we first came in, but uh, we've got it trimmed uh, and that is the, the, the place where we are actually living. And, uh, and this is the place that we're working in, but it doesn't look like this anymore. This is a, a historical shot of Portis Head, uh, the docks area in Portis Head. You can see the dock there on the, uh, the lower uh, side of the, of the photo. Uh, and that photo shows the industrial heartland of Portis Head uh, in the, well, it was like that to the mid 20th century, certainly. There were two power stations, which you can see on the, the right hand side of the photo, and uh, a chemical works on the left hand side, uh, a phosphorus uh, works, uh, and uh, ships would come in and unload their, their cargoes of uh, chemicals and materials, uh, coal for the power stations, and, uh, and this was an industrial industrial area, industrial heartland. When Paul was growing up in Bristol, um, he spent the first 18 years of his life in Bristol. He never visited Portishead, as it wasn't the sort of place you, uh, you really wanted to go to that much. But, uh, but today it looks quite different. Uh, the docks area has been turned into a marina, uh, and there are lots of uh, yachts, some of them really rather large and luxurious, and uh, the whole area around the, the docks has been built up with, uh, uh, with desirable flats and apartment living. Uh, and it looks very nice in the sunshine. It really does. Uh, uh, these are a few more shots of Porter's Head. This is the, the coastal area. And uh, some sculptures around the marina area. That one on the left uh, represents the matches that were made from the, the phosphorus works. Uh, that's uh, showing the docks area. Uh, you have Royal Portbury docks and Avonmouth docks on either side of the, the river entrance. You can see there some rather large ships actually go in and out of, uh, of these docks. This is a, a sort of an aerial shot of, uh, of Portishead uh, taken from the uh, Anglican Church Tower. 
Um, Paul was up there at uh, silly o'clock on, on uh, uh, Ascension Day, wasn't it? Um, praying from the, the top of the tower with, uh, with other folk from, uh, from all the different churches in Portishead and uh, praying for the, the town. Uh, and uh, praying for the town is something that we've, we've done quite a lot of and uh, feel is very important. Uh, so that just gives you a sense of the, the, the scope of the, of the town. Uh, that's a view of Porter's Head from the other side that shows you the Gordano Valley. Um, so that's kind of from more or less where the M5 cuts through the, the valley and you can look across and see this beautiful valley and then uh, Porter's Head uh, and the channel, the Bristol Channel behind. Um, it's the only part of the, the world that, uh, or the, the country at least, that has this particular style of pylons. Now, my husband has been into pylons since he was a child. He used to draw pylons a lot as about a seven-year-old. But that's another story. But he's never quite lost the love of them, the interest in them. So, hence this photo. <laughs> we have some bluebell woods near us. Uh, it's a beautiful part of the country. It's actually... In some ways, not unlike the the northeast, it it has contours. <laughs> it's not flat. Uh, it's got lots of green. Uh, there are some beautiful bluebell woods, uh, which we went walking in in the spring. Uh, spring comes a little earlier than uh, than it does in the northeast. Uh, this is a view uh, um, on the 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 the, the front, the, the sea front uh, in Porter's Head. There's a there's a boating lake and a lido and, uh, and a bit of a shingle beach. Um, this is a view of the one of the, the parish churches. Um, we've included that particularly just to say that we are working uh, and seeking to work ecumenically uh, in Portishead and in Pill, uh, seeking to build relationships with the other churches uh, and work alongside wherever we can. Uh, one of the other churches is called Enjoy Church, um, which, yeah, we think you should really, don't you, don't you think? But also, I like to read that two ways. I like to think of enjoying church, but also that church is, should be something that enjoys us, brings us joy, fills us with joy, yes? So I think it's a good name. Everybody else thinks it's a silly name, but I think it's a good name. Uh, this is a shot of um, uh, a, a sunrise service uh, on uh, Easter Day, Easter Sunday. And uh, Paul was asked to, to lead. Well, I say Paul was asked to lead this. Paul was volunteered, mm -hmm. volunteered by somebody, volunteered him at a meeting when he wasn't present. <laughs> Uh, so he had to get up again at silly o'clock in the morning and lead a sunrise service. It was one of only four services we took between us that, that day, wasn't it? Um, and this is Pill. This is the place that, that we live in. Uh, you can see the, the village there and the River Avon uh, at the left of the picture. This is the, the harbour at Pill. That is the harbour at its prettiest uh, because the tide is in. When the tide goes out, uh, it's basically mud. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, boats sort of lie on the mud at an angle. And, uh, and as you approach the harbour, you can always tell if the tide is in or out because you can see the, the masts and you can see whether they're at an angle or whether they're straight up. If they're straight up, the tide's in. Um, and uh, that harbour is, is quite an ancient place. It's, um, uh, it's a place that Wesley visited, John Wesley visited. Um, it, um, it was a place from which pilgrims uh, left for the New World. And um, Wesley wrote in his diary about Pill. Uh, he wrote that he rode over to Pill, a place famous from generation to generation, for stupid, brutal, abandoned wickedness. Uh, and this was the reputation that, that Pill has, and some of the, this reputation as being a, uh, a seafaring place, a place of sailors who were hard drinking and hard womanizing and 
Uh, and therefore, Pill had lots and lots of pubs, 20 or 30 odd pubs at one point in its history, and was regarded as a bit of a den of iniquity. Um, and this is the place we've moved to. <laughs> and so, but what is all the power of the world and the devil when the day of God's power is come? Many of the inhabitants seem desirous of turning from the power of Satan to God. That's October 1755. And by November 1757, Wesley is writing... So, sorry, I preached in the new preaching house at Pill. How... How is the face of things changed you. here? Such a sink of sin was scarce to be found. And now, how many are rejoicing in God their faith? So, there's a history in this place. It's an interesting place. It's sometimes regarded by people who don't live in Pill <coughs> as a bit of an insular place. Um, there are people in Pill, the Pillites, who have lived in Pill all their life. <laughs> and we really have heard people say, you get into conversation with people and they say, oh, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a you know, a, a pillite. I, I've, I've only lived here 40 years. Um, I'm, I'm an incomer. I've only been here, you know, since I was 18. Um, you know, and this is a retired person talking to you. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, there is that reputation. And yet, Wesley says there's nothing here that can't be redeemed. The power of God is, is great. Uh, that's a shot of the uh, the plaque, which is uh, by the harbour. There you look, you can see that muddy ditch in front of the plaque. That's the harbour when the tide is out. Um, and this plaque um, commemorates the sailing of uh, Robert Asprey. Francis, Francis Asprey and, and Thomas Coke. Cook. Cook. It's spelled Coke, isn't it? Yeah. But it's pronounced cook because they have peculiar ways of pronouncing things down in the southwest. Um, and these were two um, Wesleyan ministers who were commissioned by Wesley to go to the New World. And their names are so well known in America. If you're a Methodist in America, you know these names because they were the founders of the church in America. And they sailed from Pill. So this is a place with history. Uh, it also has a railway running, uh, running into it. Just, just free and spend it, yeah. uh, A great big uh, viaduct there. You can see the railway line. It's not running at the moment. There are plans to reopen it. Uh, and th therefore, Pill and, and Portishead, the, the railway would run to Portishead, uh, has been growing over the last 20 years, growing quite dramatically, uh, partly on the strength of the fact that, that there have been political promises to open the railway and everyone is very cynical about it because it's been year after year and it keeps being put back. But it, it's supposed to be coming. It's supposed to be coming in the next year or two. Um, that, that is a view of Pill which shows the um, uh, Avonmouth viaduct that, that, that takes the M5 motorway uh, over the River Avon. Uh, we, can, uh, we can hear... The motorway from from the house, um, not not very unpleasantly, but you you can. Uh, in the olden days, before the well, the olden days, you know, till really not that long ago, when they built the uh, the motorway. Before that, there was a ferry, uh, as a little ferry that would take you across the Avon uh, from Pill to Shirehampton on the other side of the the river. Uh, here's a couple of shots of the uh, Anglican churches in the village. Uh, the churches are struggling, they're declining and ageing. Um, there is some life in, in some places, uh, some churches doing work with children and young people, prioritising their resources in a, a youth worker uh, in one case, which is really good news. That's just in the last couple of months. So, you know, we wait to see. Uh, God is, has a sense of God bringing people into this place. Um, uh, you know, in many ways, the, these places feel like hard places, but God is, God is bringing people in. Right, over to me. And now it's over to Paul. 
So some of you from Stocksfield Baptist might recognise the woman in green. Um, so this was our induction service back in October. And uh, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit now about what we are doing, what we've been doing since October, how we've been spending our time. Um, we, we read the same Bible passage that we had tonight from Matthew 5, uh, because the name Salt House, which is uh, what, what the project is called, uh, derives from that passage. Uh, we, we feel God calling us to be salt and light, to be the flavouring and the, the colouring, to, to, to be his channels by which God might do wonderful things in the community. And also historically in Portis Head particularly, um, it was uh, because of the tides coming in and out, there were salt marshes. Uh, most of them have been built over, but the salt marshes were, um, you know, the water was taken off and the, the uh, the water was evaporated off and then the salt was collected and it was stored in these salt houses so that it could be purified and made more salty and then taken out to do good uh, because before refrigeration, salt was what was used as a preservative, as you know. So a sense that being a salt house where people who were called to be salty, who were called to become more salty, to be more influential and to go out and to get out and make a difference wherever we are. We're working with this other couple uh, called uh, Lindsay and Andrew. Lindsay Kaplan is uh, one of the regional ministers for the West of England Baptists. Her husband Andrew is a solicitor. Uh, good to have somebody with a proper job out of the four of us. And uh, that actually was an occasion at Christmas when we just went round some of the pubs and cafes singing Christmas carols. Hence the, uh, the Santa hat in one, on one person's head there. But uh, we, we, we get on very well. We formed a really close bond. Uh, and it was partly because Lindsay and Andrew... Uh, were people we thought we can really get on with this couple that, that gave us that sense of call to, to be in this place. Uh, the woman on the right there is uh, a uh, Hong Konger uh, who's uh, left Hong Kong and moved to the UK, as thousands and thousands have done over the last two or three years uh, because of the clampdown on democracy in Hong Kong. This is Candy, and Candy is a pastor, and she works one day a week for the West of England Baptist Association. And as part of that... Uh, uh, work. She's working with us because there are quite a few people from Hong Kong living in Portishead uh, and wanting to, uh, a number of Christian people from Hong Kong, but also people who are not yet Christians but are interested in the faith. And uh, rather than um, seeing them go all the way into the big city of Bristol to, to find a church, and there are some Chinese and Cantonese speaking churches in Bristol, um, what we're trying to work with Candy to, to help to happen is, is for something local that is uh, uh, in their mother tongue, but is also going to enable them to build bridges with the English-speaking community. Uh, so we are already a bilingual community. We, we, we are Cantonese-speaking and English-speaking. Um, and you're going to ask me to tell, tell you some Cantonese, and that, that, that's where I need to uh, still do a bit of learning, okay, because uh, we're not they on the Cantonese. Um, that's just page from our Facebook, but uh, again, to, to show that we're seeking to be a community. That's how we are expressing ourselves. Uh, to the wider world, move on. And uh, the first thing that we really, well, first thing we did was, was lots of prayer. But then out of the praying, we felt uh, that we should uh, organise a gathering. Um, we advertised it on the Facebook page. We had the connections through Candy with, the, uh, with some of the Hong Kong community. And just see who would come. And if we look at the next slide, so the folk hall is where we meet. It's, it's a, um, owned by the council. Uh, uh, but there's this big hall, similar size to, to this room here. And uh, the first occasion was in Advent, where Andrew got us all making Christmas puddings. Um, because some of you might be aware of a, a date in the diary that the Anglicans call Stir Up Sunday, because of one of the prayers that's used in the uh, uh, prayer book, uh, about God's stirring us up to, uh, uh, to, to greater love for him. And it's traditionally when you stir up your Christmas pudding mixture. So we had all these Hong Kongers who've never even seen a Christmas pudding before learning all about our tradition of Christmas pudding making. Uh, so that's why there's all the ingredients on the table. Uh, and we got a number of people that. Then we, we did one in February, which was to celebrate the Chinese New Year. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we, we have done some things at Easter in the same place. That's a tenebrae service, if you're familiar with that, where you... Uh, Gradually, you, you read through the, the, um, the passion story in, uh, in the Bible, lots and lots of readings, and then uh, as, as it gets nearer and nearer to Jesus being put on the cross and being killed, uh, you put the lights out, so it gets darker and darker and darker, and you leave in darkness. You do it on uh, Good Friday or, or the Saturday, 
uh, and, and it's to, to just kind of hold that, that sadness and that sense of grief and that sense of loss before we rush into the joy of Easter Sunday. Uh, there you can see, uh, as we advertise things, we do it uh, in, in uh, two languages. So it's been fascinating. And again, we didn't have any idea that we'd be uh, working with people from a different nationality, but that's the way God has uh, opened the doors. Uh, then we had this uh, young man come to visit us, uh, and, and some of the folk from Stocksfield on the uh, front row will know him well. This is uh, Gareth Davis Jones, singer songwriter. Don't know if you've ever had him here, but but organise a gig for him sometimes because he's fantastic. Um, and he's he's a folk musician, um, Christian folk musician, and and wonderful to to uh, bring people together to to uh, have an event that's accessible for both those of faith and those not of faith. Uh, we're, we've also started to get involved in various projects. This one actually was up and running before Barbara and I arrived. So Lindsay and Andrew, uh, our co-workers, have been in the area for four years before we arrived. Uh, and Lindsay had helped set up with the Anglican Church um, a project called the Willow Garden, uh, where people are socially prescribed. So people with mental health difficulties, people suffering anxiety, depression, people who are maybe stuck in the home and are fearful to go out, uh, but who might benefit from contact with nature, from, from working uh, with, with plants and with gardens, and just being out of doors, uh, are prescribed by their GP surgeries to, uh, if they want to, to come along to this garden. So once a week, um, we, we uh, get the garden going, and uh, uh, that was the day that we built the little willow uh, uh, structure, and uh, um, it's been wonderful to see people uh, who've never before, well, for a long time, um, being felt comfortable, confident enough to socialise, coming out and doing something, chatting, as, as well as the gardening. We spend half the time drinking tea and eating cake because it's important to give people the opportunity to have a conversation and just to, to, to get over those barriers of uh, uh, social interaction. Um, and that shows you another bit of the garden. And one of the, uh, uh, the people who came to work with us that day was... Uh, um, an illustrator by background, so sprayed the happy Christmas on the uh, on the concrete. But it's it's coming on. It's looking nice. And we we run once a month uh, an outdoor expression of church in the garden called Willow Church. Um, it, it it started strongly when we were there, but it's kind of a bit on the decline now. And we're just having a review of it and wondering how we can re-advertise it uh, and and boost the numbers. We're, we're convinced it's not over yet. One of the other things that Barbara and I felt called to is to get involved in community groups. So uh, this is the Portishead Running Club. Uh, lovely uh, coloured tops, as you can see, and I'm somewhere at the back there. Uh, so I've joined the Running Club, and Barbara has joined the Posset Singers, that one of the local choirs. So, so she sings and I run, um, and uh, we're, we're just trying to get out of the Christian bubble into places where we're going to meet people who... Uh, uh, might be open to faith. That doesn't sound too good, does it? I sing and he runs. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't run away from the singing. No, 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 no. obviously not, no. Um, and as Barbara said, we, we've been involved in ecumenical things, so this was a Good Friday uh, walk of witness. Um, moving on. Uh, this was the prayers on the top of the church tower. Uh, and as we said, praying has been really important. So we have particularly tried to find other Christians uh, from other churches who have a heart to pray for the area. And uh, so three mornings a week, we're meeting with other people to pray for either Pill or Portishead. Uh, we, we also do get to enjoy uh, food together. And, and a lot of what we do is, uh, is gathered around tables, actually. So as well as the gatherings in the folk hall, where we bring lots of people together, well, 20 or 30 people is how many we've been getting, um, we're, we're really wanting the heart of what we do to be around uh, a meal and around a table and around homes. Uh, so uh, this is us practising uh, on a retreat that we had together. But now we have a small group that meets on a Sunday night. Uh, we, we have soup and bread, uh, and then we do what we did earlier today, read a bit of the Bible and just ask people, how's God speaking to you? And then, and we'll come back to this at the end of the tonight, what are you going to do about it? What has God been saying, and therefore what are you going to do about it? Okay, we don't have our own premises, but in Portishead, uh, a former... Um, uh, evangelical church uh, which um, uh, the congregation got so small they were not sustainable anymore they, they, the congregation has closed and the trustees have been looking to uh, sell the building um, but uh, part of their values is that they want a place that's been dedicated as a place of worship still to be used for Christian worship if possible so uh, that limits the, the number of possible users 
Um, uh, if nobody were to come forward, then I guess they would look more widely because they have their charitable responsibilities as well. But we are, uh, and have been for the last couple of months, just praying about whether uh, this building, which another church in Portis had to look at and decided it wasn't for them, uh, there's no other interested parties, whether it might be a suitable base for us to work out of. Now, we, we are valuing your prayers about this because um, buildings can be a great asset, but they can also be uh, a challenge. Uh, the Anglican churches that we saw in an earlier picture, um, both of them are, are not really suitable for the purposes of those congregations. And, and one of those Anglican church buildings has a £300,000 repair bill and has uh, got a congregation of about 20 people who, who are struggling to uh, even think about raising that amount of money. Buildings also shape what you do. And the danger with the building is you become kind of separated from the community. You stay in your nice comfortable four walls and are not getting out and about where God necessarily calls us to be. So we're praying about that. But if we did take it on, uh, we haven't got any money to buy it. So that's another, <laughs> another issue. God will have to provide. Uh, and we're, we're, we're just wondering whether that's somewhere for us. Okay. Oh, there's, there's some more, but we'll, we'll pause there because I think uh, um, we said we'd do 45 minutes or so and then have some food and drink. But that's uh, we'll go on and tell you a little bit about some of the other things we're doing alongside the pioneering and then we will uh, look at a few principles we've learned that might also be helpful for you in the ministry and the work that your church is a part of and then we'll pray together at the end.